few folks still filtering in, but in the interest of time, I'd love to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Katie Grogan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first lecture in our 10-part series, Advancing Health Equity with Medical Humanities. This series was developed in partnership with New York University, the NYU Grossman School of Medicine, and the Arnold P. Gold Foundation. Our initiative is part of the Foundation's Gold Human Insights webinar series, and we want to express our deepest gratitude to the Gold Foundation for their support, their patience, and their partnership in launching this project with special recognition to Pia Pine Miller and Ann Bretter. I also must recognize my partners in the development of this series, Dr. Kim Adams, who is an American Council of Learned Societies Emerging Voices Fellow at Stanford University, where her work focuses on public humanities and medical humanities, as well as Sharonic Bosu, who's a PhD candidate in English at NYU, where he focuses on economic thought, literary rhetoric, and public humanities. We're very excited to have our featured speakers tonight who are all connected to the Narrative Medicine Program at Columbia University and are all doing interdisciplinary work engaging the humanities, especially the tools and methodologies of narrative medicine to advance social justice and health equity. They are Dr. Sayantani Dasgupta, who was originally trained in pediatrics and public health and is now a faculty member in the Narrative Medicine Master's Program the Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race, and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. Zara Khan, a graduate of the master's program and now a lecturer at Columbia and co-chair of the university seminar on narrative health and social justice. And Yoshiko Iwai, also a graduate of the program and now a student at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Medicine. They'll be presenting a talk entitled Abolition Medicine, Reimagining the Role of Social Justice in Healthcare. And we're thrilled to have two of the three speakers here with us live for questions and discussion following the lecture. And a few quick logistical notes. We're going to ask that you kindly keep your mics off. If anyone runs into any technical issues, we can just hop in and mute you if needed. Um, and please go ahead and put your questions into the chat as they come up. You need not wait until the very end. Um, Sharonic will be monitoring the chat and will help to synthesize the questions and we'll read them aloud on your behalf during the Q&A portion. Uh, so with that, welcome again. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Adams. Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys. So all I'm going to do is share my screen and we'll watch this amazing lecture. The best healthcare is compassionate, collaborative, and scientifically excellent. Thank you for being on this mission with us to ensure humanism and healthcare for all. This is a Gold Human Insight webinar produced by the Gold Foundation and its partners. Hello, I'm Pia Pine Miller, Senior Director of Strategy and Business Development for the Gold Foundation. The Gold Foundation created the Gold Human Insight webinar series to bring inspirational live and pre-recorded webinars to healthcare professionals and learners. Our 2022 theme is renewing our commitment to humanism. With the myriad of challenges facing healthcare systems today, including patient disconnection, clinician burnout, and even more challenges highlighted during this time of the syndemic of COVID and social justice issues, the Gold Foundation's vision of a better future remains more urgent than ever. Today's Gold Human Insight webinar is one in a series that is part of a special collaboration with NYU School of Medicine, which is an institution that is a member of the Gold Partners Council a group of medical schools, hospitals, and healthcare systems that are leaders in humanism and healthcare. Thank you to our presenters and our audience for everything that you do. Today's lecture is the first in a 10-part series on advancing healthcare equity with medical humanities. These slides provide a description of the larger series and accreditation information from the NYU CME office. They are required for attendees seeking CME credit and are available to all who are interested through the Gold Foundation website. Hi everyone, 
Um, thank you so much for inviting us to participate in the NYU CME webinar series on advancing health equity with the medical humanities. Here are disclosures. And thank you again, everyone, for joining our talk on abolition medicine, reimagining the role of social justice in healthcare. There is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. There is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. There is nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. Octavia Butler. The COVID-19 pandemic has pushed medicine and indeed all of humanity into a moment of crisis. But in that crisis is an opportunity, an opportunity to see things anew, leave behind old practices that do not serve us and radically reimagine our futures. As novelist and activist Orin Kuti Roy said last year in an article entitled, The Pandemic is a Portal, Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Racist violence is a public health crisis. We can choose to carry it through to the other side of this pandemic portal, or we can leave it behind, radically reimagining a new world on the other side. It is on this premise that we are honored to be here sharing our work on abolition medicine. And, and engaging in conversation about what work we in medicine and the health professions might do to build an anti-racist future. We began with a quote by the great science fiction novelist Octavia Butler, because to talk about abolition medicine is inherently an act of speculation. It is an act of imagination about an anti-racist tomorrow a tomorrow that is not here yet, but that is possible both to envision and work toward. My name is Yoshiko Iwai, and I'm a medical student at UNC School of Medicine. Prior to moving to Chapel Hill, I was at Columbia University in New York, um, where I received my master's degrees in narrative medicine and creative nonfiction. It's also where I met Sayantani and Zara. Um, my research and academic interests include medical education, carceral health, and cancer care. Hi, everyone. My name is Zara Khan, and I teach in the graduate program in narrative medicine at Columbia, where I also received my master's. I currently co-chair the university seminar on narrative health and social justice, and I'm a co-editor and co-founder of The Life Jacket, a zine about third world feminisms, community, and liberation. And my name is Sayantani Dasgupta, or Shayantani Dasgupta. And while my original training is in pediatrics and public health, I've been working in the field of health humanities for almost 20 years. I'm a faculty member of the graduate program in narrative medicine at Columbia University, a program I also helped co-found. I also have a shared appointment in Columbia's Center for the Study of Ethnicity and Race and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society. And my academic work is at the interstices of story, race, justice, and speculation. Before we get to the heart of our presentation, we thought we would answer the question I'm sure many of you have, what is narrative medicine? In short, it is the scholarly endeavor to honor the role of story in the healthcare encounter. If we agree that the ability to elicit, attend, and engage with narratives of illness and disability are integral to health to healthcare, narrative medicine seeks to train students and providers with these critical skills. Narrative medicine and the broader health humanities is committed to honoring the stories shared between providers and patients, as well as understanding the structural narratives that contextualize experiences of health and illness. Narrative medicine teaches us that stories matter, particularly at moments of crisis, trauma, and upheaval. Language affects the way that policies, actions, and attitudes are shaped towards justice or injustice. 
Who tells a story? Whose voice is heard and who's silenced? Who is framed as heroic and who villainous? All of these questions drive socially just narrative, narrative work. We began working on a collective essay in spring of 2020 when narratives around healthcare heroes were becoming a central part of our public consciousness. In particular, we were disturbed by the militaristic nature of some of the healthcare heroes' stories, because of course, doctors and nurses are not soldiers. Antibiotics are not bombs. Hospitals are not the front lines. Hardworking medical trainees are not gunners. And neither disease nor patients are the enemy. Militarized language valorizes aggression and violence in medical training and the clinical encounter while confounding the loyalties of healthcare workers who serve and protect individuals and communities in need. The dangers of military metaphors in medicine were most famously described by Susan Sontag in her book, Illness as Metaphor, but they continue to dominate professional and lay imaginings of healthcare. Doctors and nurses are not soldiers, and yet in the late spring of 2020, even as U.S. deaths from COVID-19 skyrocketed, the U.S. military conducted flyovers above multiple cities to honor what were dubbed America's healthcare heroes. These expensive gestures were taking place at the same time that healthcare workers were fighting for adequate personal protective equipment. Even as the country gathered nightly to clap for healthcare heroes, lives were lost on the front lines and among the marginalized communities most profoundly impacted by COVID-19. Militaristic language frames illness and death as inevitable plot lines rather than preventable occurrences. The hero's journey, or the monomyth, exists in narratology as a template in which the hero answers a call to adventure, often encountering supernatural aid, challenges, defeats, and transformation before returning home. Personal sacrifice is necessarily folded into this narrative archetype, and while some degree of occupational risk is justified during the pandemic by the AMA code, uh, by the AMA code of ethics and Hippocratic oath, the scope of sacrifice becomes difficult to discern. These militaristic metaphors also reinforce xenophobic nationalism, narratively pitting American heroes against foreign enemies. In the aftermath of 9/11. The cultural need for heroic figures raised emergency personnel, like firefighters, to the status of heroes in ways that mirror healthcare workers during COVID-19. President Bush's use of military rhetoric to create an American identity centered on the war on terror is reminiscent of President Trump's policies, like the border wall, Muslim ban, and COVID-19 regulations, which weaponize xenophobia in the name of patriotism. The narrative of healthcare heroes reinforces tropes of villainous external threats that encroach on the American body politic, even as a very real virus threatens the bodies of US citizens. Consider for instance, the rise in anti-Asian violence and its connection to rhetorical racisms, including the China virus. Physicians are also implicated in this trope. There are numerous instances in the last year of Asian American physicians or healthcare heroes facing racist comments from patients, including refusal of treatment. These are some clips from a video created by Dr. Zhu, an ophthalmologist in Roland Heights, California, and a group of her Asian American colleagues who all got together to make this video as a way of challenging anti-Asian sentiment. Among these images, you'll see one right in the middle, uh, one notable quote, which is, but I'm on the front lines risking my life to save yours. Then in the summer of 2020, Uprisings erupted across the US in response to a different public health crisis, that of structural and institutional racism. As healthcare workers took to the streets to support their communities, some parts of the state moved from lionizing its healthcare personnel to injuring or arresting them along with protesters, sometimes even destroying their medical tents. Police SWAT teams swooped down on many US cities, and the difference between real and metaphorical soldiers became startlingly clear. The militarized police and National Guard resembled an army, while healthcare workers were stuck with persisting shortages of PPE and, in our view, a meaningless metaphor of heroism. At this time, the intersections between public health and policing shifted to the center of national discourse. 
suddenly conversations about policing and police abolition were everywhere. It was at this particular time that we three practitioners of narrative medicine shifted our focus and began thinking of the connections or lack of connection between some of the militarist, militaristic healthcare heroes narratives and the real responsibilities of medicine. We began thinking about the intersection of medicine and abolition. And it was at this point that we wrote and ultimately published in, uh, in The Lancet an article called Abolition Medicine. The question we began with was a simple one. Who do you serve? Who do you protect? We borrowed it from a 2016 collection on policing and yet felt like it was a question with particular relevance to medicine. Now, this is not a new question. It's been asked before. American medicine was, after all, founded on a history of disturbing racist practices. Consider the invention of the pelvic speculum by Dr. J. Marion Sims, who has been called the father of modern gynecology. When I was in medical school, certainly, and I don't know if this is still the case now, decades later, I was never told the history of this important invention, nor the way that Dr. Sims used his new speculum to develop surgeries for vesicle vaginal fistulas. I did not know, nor was ever told, that these surgeries were conducted unanesthetized on enslaved women, most of whose names history has forgotten, except those of Betsy, Anarka, and Lucy. Not only did these women endure dozens of painful surgeries, but they often served as assistants in these procedures, forced to hold each other down. Sims also apparently invited medical and other spectators to view his procedures. Needless to, needless to say, consent was not an issue on the, as it were, table in these situations. It wasn't until some students from my own institution Columbia University, protested a statue of Sims, which was up near our campus uh, on near Riverside Park, that this statue in New York City came down in 2017. Other statues of Sims remain in the country, including this one in South Carolina. Who do we serve? Who do we protect? We could fill the entirety of our talk with other examples of medical racism. We could speak about the infamous Tuskegee syphilis experiments conducted from 1932 to 1972, during which African-American men in Alabama were denied access to treatment in a study designed to observe the natural history of untreated syphilis. We could speak about the support of eugenic ideals within medicine and by American practitioners, including the North Carolina Eugenics Board, who encouraged the reproduction of desirables people with um, desirable traits and supported a decrease in reproduction by undesirables. We could speak about the ubiquitous fitter families contests across the US where during a state fair, while you show off your prize winning pumpkin or your prize winning livestock, you could also compete for the fittest, meaning white able-bodied family. If this sounds familiar, you may be recognizing it from Nazi Germany who drew inspiration for, for its concentration camps from eugenics movements in the US and UK, not the other way around. We can look at how in the name of these eugenic ideals, physicians conducted the forced sterilization of people like Carrie Buck, who was perceived to be disabled or feeble-minded, and activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who was sterilized without her knowledge or consent in a procedure so common that Fannie Lou Hamer famously called it the Mississippi appendectomy. The list continues with the forced sterilizations of indigenous women by the Indian Health Services in the 60s and Latina women in California through the 70s. And we would be remiss if we did not point to the way this practice is still continuing today inside prisons, group homes, and detention centers. Who do we serve? Who do we protect? How do we make sense of a 2016 study that showed that medical students think that black patients feel less pain than white patients? This finding can be traced to cruel self-serving theories that justified the corporal punishment of enslaved black people 
by suggesting that Black people had thicker skin and therefore, therefore could tolerate harsher physical conditions and pain better than white people. And this was related to current day evidence that physicians undertreat Black patients' pain. How is the Hoffman study in turn related to the epidemic of Black maternal mortality in this country? The connection that we see working between all of these histories and phenomena is that they all point to institutional racism. Who do we serve? Who do we protect? If we want a safer and more equitable system of public health, we must reckon with our healthcare system's history of racist practices. Contending with that violence and working to resist hundreds of years of oppression is part of our work. And we in medicine have been struggling to do abolition medicine work, whether or not we've been calling it that. For example, in fall of 2014, medical students across the US staged die-ins as part of a wave of nationwide Black Lives Matter protests. The intention was to create a shocking visual spectacle, laying on the line, white coats for Black lives. The images were all over social media, students of all colors dressed in white coats, lying prone against eerily clean tile floors. These medical students' collective protests not only created visual spectacle, but produced a dynamic speculative fiction. What would it mean if instead of Michael Brown or Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, these other more seemingly elite bodies were subjected to police violence? In another viral image, a group of black male medical students posed wearing hoodies beneath their white coats, making clear that the bodies of some future doctors could perhaps be more easily targeted by state sanctioned violence. They tried to bury us, read a sign held by one of the students. They didn't realize we were seeds. Similarly, in 2018, after the publication of the American College of Physicians position paper on the country's epidemic of gun violence, the, nation, the National Rifle Association tweeted that anti-gun doctors should stay in their lane, which incited the hashtag, this is my lane movement, um, by US physicians and other narrative-based action. Here too, doctors relied on the spectacle of visual storytelling, posting images of their bloodied scrubs and shoes and the exhaustion of their post-shift faces as they described the horrors of treating victims of gun violence. These physicians and physicians in training told painful stories and created arresting visual ones, not only to make clear who they serve and protect, but also to impact concrete changes in policy, legislation, and governmental funding. Who do we serve? Who do we protect? In 2020, many healthcare workers, again, knelt in solidarity with protesters and delivered care to those injured by rubber bullets, tear gas, and police violence as they called out the names of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. In narrative medicine and the health humanities, we often turn to structural competency, a term coined by Drs. Jonathan Metzl and Helena Hansen at NYU, which suggests that medical trainees need to be taught to recognize upstream causes, such as food deserts and housing inequality, of downstream health consequences, such as heart disease and diabetes. What has become clear for us is that police violence is an upstream cause of downstream disproportionate suffering. Police brutality is, therefore, a public health emergency. As healthcare workers, there's a need to imagine new possibilities for public safety that emerge from public health as opposed to endangering it. We must tell new stories about medicine, community, and care. One of the ways these new stories can be told is through the priorities of our healthcare organizations. In a 2018 statement, the American Public Health Association put out a policy statement called Policing Harms Public Health, in which they stated the following. While public safety is essential for public health, as a society, we have delegated this important function almost exclusively to law enforcement. Evidence of continued law enforcement violence shows that US policing has failed to equitably deliver safety, placing the inequitable burden of mental and physical harm on socially and economically marginalized populations. The critical resistance group went on to say, policing is a public health issue and encourage the public health community to shift away from reformist measures and toward structural root level changes to the harms that policing and by extension prisons cause to the health of our communities. 
Now, what we're contending here today is not just that medicine must deal with the downstream effects of upstream policing and carceral systems, but that medicine can and must have a role in reimagining and creating new visions of prevention itself. Consider, for example, the framing of community safety offered by Minneapolis City Council person Philippe Cunningham during a June 2020 virtual town hall posed, uh, hosted by President Barack Obama on policing and racism. In Cunningham's words, over policing, criminalization, and mass incarceration have not kept our communities safer. In fact, people getting caught in the criminal justice system further disenfranchises black and brown folks, pushing us more to the margins of society. Our system is obviously broken. It's time for a new system of public safety. What does it mean to keep our communities safe? We have a paradigm for this. It's the public health approach to public safety. Cunningham here is thinking about violence as a contagious disease that spreads interpersonally and intergenerationally which is a preventive framing. In other words, it's not enough to recognize that racist violence or police violence is a public health crisis, which it is. We must also ask ourselves what we in medicine can do to prevent it from occurring. There can be no apolitical humanitarian approach to police brutality. The violence that is and has been happening across the US is caused by an institution with concrete funding sources, the police. It's not an ethical or humanitarian act to patch up people who are being torn apart by guns without doing something about the availability of those guns. Similarly, it is not an ethical or humanitarian act to continue patching up communities who are being murdered by police brutality without doing something about the police state itself. Past attempts at US police reform, whether body cameras or increased anti-bias training have not been enough to prevent racist police brutality or the deaths caused by it. We believe we must serve and protect the communities we care for by working toward an alternative systems of community care, which brings us to abolition medicine. So what is abolition medicine? Abolition medicine invokes W.E.B. Du Bois' 1935 notion of abolition democracy, a vision based not only on breaking systems down, but necessitates building up a new, healthier, and more just society. Abolition has been pushed forward and expanded by activist scholars like Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Mariam Kaba, who have argued that the abolition of slavery was just one step in an ongoing process of abolitionist practices to address racialized systems of policing, surveillance, and incarceration. What's become clear to us is that our nation's network of profit-producing corporations that supply services of health and safety are intrinsically connected. The military industrial complex is tied to the prison industrial complex, which is tied to the medical industrial complex, all through mechanisms of policing. Therefore, if abolition is the resisting and generative framework to the prison industrial complex that envisions new strategies of addressing harm without reproducing oppression, then our contention is that abolition medicine is the organizing tool and response to the harms reproduced by the medical industrial complex. The essential work of abolition medicine is to interrogate upstream structures that, that enable downstream violence, like police brutality, in addition to reimagining the work of medicine altogether as an anti-racist practice. The question, who do you serve? Who do you protect? now takes on a whole new meaning when we place it in the context of abolition medicine. What then does abolition medicine look like? Just as examples of policing and violence stretch back years, so too do histories of mobilizing resistance, mutual aid, and collective care networks that exist independent, independently of formalized institutional structures. We see this lineage of community care and health activism in the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program which aimed to feed thousands of children across the country through mutual aid for each other. 
and in their National Sickle Cell Screening Program. Theirs was a public health effort created to meet the health needs of a community, and it falls on the same spectrum of public health approaches to public safety that we saw the Young Lords implement in the 1970s, a Puerto Rican liberation organization that protested and successfully organized an inpatient treatment program for opioid uh, use disorder with Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx and provided additional support measures with acupuncture. It's also in line with the efforts we see today in Oakland by the Anti-Police Terror Project with their program MH First, a mobile mental health first responder team comprised of mental health professionals, doctors, nurses, peers, and community members the MH First team disrupts the need for law enforcement in response to mental health crises by giving non-punitive and life-affirming interventions through de-escalation assistance. And these are just a few examples that currently exist of abolition medicine in action. In her introduction to Mariam Kaba's new book, We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transformative Justice, Naomi Murakawa says that Kaba's work is a portal connecting us to living currents of abolitionist organizing. What would it mean for us to take medicine through the portal and towards new possibilities? Abolition medicine means challenging race-based diagnostic tools and treatment guidelines that reinforce antiquated and scientifically inaccurate notions of biological race, like race correction and EGFR reporting, which perpetuates disparities in access to care. In the words of legal scholar Dorothy Roberts, the way doctors practice medicine continues to promote a false and toxic view of humanity. There's a failure of imagination when it comes to race. What would happen if doctors stopped treating patients by race? Suppose they rejected an 18th century classification system and incorporated instead the most advanced knowledge of human genetic diversity and unity that human beings cannot be classified into biological races. What if instead of using race as a crude proxy for a more important factor like SES, doctors actually investigated and addressed that important factor. Race medicine is bad medicine. It's poor science and it's a false interpretation of humanity. Abolition medicine means integrating longitudinal anti-racism and bias training into medical education, including the history of racism and structural factors that produce and perpetuate health disparities while actively recruiting, retaining and supporting black and other faculty, staff, and students from minority backgrounds. Supporting institutional efforts that provide reparations to communities of color devastated by unethical medical experimentation is another instrument of social change for abolition medicine. For example, the class action lawsuit that ultimately awarded monetary restitution and a lifetime of free medical care to the families involved in the Tuskegee study. Practicing abolition medicine entails healthcare workers joining national conversations about police and prison abolition and using their social power to divest from policing structures and reinvest in programs like MH First that build community capacity for mental health care, youth development, education, and employment, as well as harm reduction efforts around substance use, housing insecurity, and incarceration. Abolition medicine means supporting, listening, and champ championing student-led initiatives like Future Doctors in Politics, an organization founded, founded by Harvard Medical Students in January of 2021 that empowers medical students to take an active role in political discourse and drive socially just and equitable policymaking as parts of their future career. Abolition medicine means supporting emerging movements around the country, like the Bay Area's Freedom Community Clinic, and Vanderbilt's Educational Garden Initiative, which provides fresh food to Nashville's community of patients that visit the Vanderbilt uh, student-run health clinic. Abolition medicine means creating spaces for students and young professionals to engage in critical discussions to envision structural change, such as UC San Diego's Coalition for Abolition Medicine, a student-run activist organization, or Scientani's course, on abolition medicine at Columbia, which tackles issues of medical racism and anti-racism. It also means encouraging and institutionally supporting efforts already happening in medical education across the country. I'm sure also at NYU, as we were invited to speak here today. Prior to matriculating, I was assigned Harriet Washington's medical apartheid, along with all of my incoming classmates as a necessary fixture of the curriculum. 
These discussions are not tangential or supplementary to medicine. They are the history, present, and future of the institution itself. If the emphasis of medicine is to first do no harm, then we must move health practices away from punitive models and violent systems and towards something more transformative. We see, us all, we see all of us as necessary leaders in the movement for an abolition medicine, nurturing that vision and building those alternative practices is everyone's job. The question of what a public health approach to public safety looks like continues to be an act of radical imagination. But at one point in US history, extraordinary but, system but necessary systemic overhauls like the abolition of slavery too felt like the impossible. Both medical progress and racial justice are ultimately acts of speculation until they are actualized. By imagining, then working toward new cures and technologies to address disease, medicine itself is always committing new acts of speculation. By imagining ourselves into a more racially just future, invested in enriching communities, abolitionist physicians and nurses can work toward a future of health and social justice. Narrative medicine gives us the tools to see how a phenomenon like militarized metaphors in healthcare obscures structural context by making unclear who we in healthcare serve and protect. Healthcare workers are not instruments of the state. Our duty is to heal communities in need and critique those systems that allow minoritized communities to be disproportionately harmed while rebuilding those systems in healthier ways. There are no prescriptions or shortcuts because, as Naomi Murakawa reminds us, there are no life hacks to revolution. Abolition requires dismantling the oppressive systems that live out there and within us. Abolition medicine, then, is a practice of inward and outward speculation, of dreaming of a more racially just future and acting to bring that vision to fruition. It's asking ourselves, what is the healing work we aspire to and making that a reality in the world? So here are our many references, which we're happy to share with you. So, and as well as our contact information, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, and now, we get to ask questions of these wonderful speakers. Let's give them a round of applause. I guess as the questions come rolling in, there's already one in the chat. So we can begin with that. I'll just, um, for Zara and Santini, I'll just read it out. A question for all the panelists and anyone else who would care to weigh in. What would you say to a medical students who believes that it is not the responsibility of physicians to work on these issues? Um, I, I thank you for your question, Catherine. Um, I think as somebody who's been both in medical school and medical education, I would say probably the same thing I would say to somebody who says they don't believe it's their responsibility to learn, I don't know, physiology or, <laughs> or you, know, you know, I'm going to be an ophthalmologist. I don't really need to know about the gastrointestinal tract, you know, um, too bad. <laughs> This is what healthcare is. Um, and I think, it, you know, in a less, with less humor, um, I would say that unfortunately, young folks entering medicine have gotten the message, you know, from a kind of professional structures and professional cultures, including kind of a hidden curriculum, what counts and what doesn't count as uh, healthcare knowledge. And I think it's our job to really be uh, thoughtful and critical about that messaging and uh, alter it at an institutional and structural level such that it is self-evident that, you know, caring for this, you know, whatever this broad array of issues, uh, issues of abolition, issues of anti-racism, issues of structural violence, um, if we change the educational structures and systems such that 
it is clear that, you know, why these issues are important, then those individual naysayers, they can naysay, but there are structural kind of educational pieces, pedagogical pieces already in place to address their concerns. Like what, well, I would probably, you know, in a serious note, ask them why they felt like, why, you know, what are you seeing as the problem? Why don't you feel like this is an issue to address? Um, how do you see it not connecting to healthcare? Something like that. Um, I think if I can hop on and add to Zayantani's, um, Zayantani's response, I would also ask the student, just like, how do they envision healing? How do you envision healing work? And how do you envision care work? And how does that work with understandings of do no harm or like this call to do no harm? And I think part of the question reveal something about how we see individualism work in these spaces, right? Like, how do we buy into individualism? What does it teach us? How is it reinforced in our healthcare system? How does it shape the way we think about healing work and care work and freedom? And I think if we could shift like the tone from individualistic frameworks towards thinking of life and possibilities in a collectivist framework, like how can we nourish and support communities as a collective? That's a really big part of what we're asking, I think, in our presentation here. And it's part of what we hope, you know, folks who are in the medical education system can start to think about if they haven't already started thinking about thinking up and, but, you know, thinking around some of these issues and working on those solutions together. I mean, what you might notice from our presentation is that we don't have kind of a scripted um, sort of answers or a bunch of solutions. We give you examples of things that abolition medicine can look like. Um, but really part of the call, I think, is for all of us to work on these solutions together and to think about healing work and care work, not just as individualistic, but also as collective. And I think hopefully if we shift that framework a little bit, people might come to those answers on their own. Thank you so much, Gatun, for that question. And Shantani and uh, Zara for the answers. We have one more question uh, next from Yoselin. How can we incorporate SES in our clinical appointments? And how do we promote this amongst residents who get 20 minutes appointments and are often burnt out from clinic? You know, Yoselin, thank you for your question. I think it may be related to Catherine's question, which is kind of an um, individual level. And I think Catherine points out uh, physicians may already feel overburdened. So I think just to re-echo what Zara was saying, I think what we're suggesting here is not kind of one more set of to-do tasks for an individual physician. What we're suggesting is a structural overhaul, a reimagining of what healthcare means altogether. And that's an endeavor that we all are engaged in. That's not like 10 more minutes of work for this individual physician. It's asking something structural, like um, actually some Harvard Law School students recently published a piece on policing in the emergency room, right? Um, the, what is the role of police presence in the emergency room? Should we as institutions allow arrests to be happening, uh, you know, handcuffing to be happening in our emergency rooms or are our emergency departments kind of sanctuary spaces? That's a structural question, right? Um, so an emer one emergency room resident who's working in that context, is not, it's not changing the nature of his, you know, history and physical, what it's doing is it's changing the nature of the entire context in which, you know, this person works. Does that, Zara, am I getting to, am I, or am I just waving my arms? Yeah, no, I think, <laughs> no, I, yeah, no, I think that was great. I think, um, you know, one thing that Mariam Kaba is somebody we come to a lot um, in throughout this presentation and she, her work is um, a lot of which you know, what we lean on. And um, one of the things that she kind of advocates for is shrinking the space between our values and our actions. She says this phrase in her book, and it's something that she oftentimes speaks on when she, you know, jumps on, um, on calls like these. Um, so I think that that's something for us to think about is shrinking the, the space between our values and our actions and what that can look like. I kind of leave that out there. I think that's a great segue to the next, to Kenzie's question, which is, uh, what would you recommend to students who desire to mitigate systemic causes of health inequity, but fear professional retribution in response to activism? You want to go first, Sarah? 
Yeah, I think I think so much of um, I think so much of this question. That's a great question, by the way, because I think fear and fear tactics too, um, part of the ways in which um, policing works in institutions to surveil, to control, to silence, right? And so um, I think part of it again comes back to the collective is finding people who um, who who feel the same way that you do about. Um, confronting some of these bigger structural issues, um, collectivizing together, even if it just means that you're getting together and um, talking about these issues together, thinking about ways in which you can impact change and drive action in your own individual spaces. It, it can be very small. It can be something as small as um, starting a reading group, you know, with, with you and your friends. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, something much bigger than that, that already is impactful and that already can create ripples of change. Um, but I think, um, I think it comes down to thinking of the collective and then also thinking about how you can be involved um, in healing work and care work um, in your local communities. So maybe outside of your hospital environment or outside of your um, uh, you know, medical school, how can you be involved in maybe mutual aid efforts in your local community that are abolitionist efforts in some respect, right, that are working to um, support communities in their in their healing. Um, I think a little bit of that thinking of what you can do in your own spaces, um, whether it's, you know, creating community gardens or reading networks, things like that in your own spaces, and then also stepping outside of your professional space and thinking of what you can do for the community that you're already embedded in. Um, those are two things that come to mind. Amazing. Uh, Marie asks, what can abolition medicine do to highlight the intersections of poverty and health, including insurance access? I mean, I think um, we can't talk about abolition without talking about capitalism. We can't talk about healthcare without talking about capitalism. And uh, I was just looking up the name of the book, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's uh, recent book. I think it's, it's coming out. It's coming out in October of 2022. It's called Change Everything, Racial Capitalism and the Case for Abolition. Um, so she really talks about the interconnections of uh, the fact that capitalism is necessarily racialized, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, already the abolitionist thinkers that we're drawing from are making those connections between racialization and capitalism. And I think that it's um, incredibly important for then as we translate, you know, broader concepts of abolition, which are addressing the prison industrial complex, right? Which are um, addressing kind of the, uh, systemic force uh, and murder by police, as we're using those concepts in and translating them into something called abolition medicine and forming coalitions uh, across this work um, to look at the medical industrial complex that we think about the way that capitalism works in medicine. And I think um, it's, you know, the issue of, uh, you know, from pharmaceutical costs to health insurance, it's, I think, all deeply interconnected uh, to the work. Zara, do you have other thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I just kind of wanted to um, kind of add that um, part of what we realize when we take a look um, at these issues up close and personally is that our system, it's not that our system is broken, it's that our system is designed to benefit some people more than others, right? And that's true of our healthcare system, it's true of our medical education system in terms of who has access to quality care, in terms of who's priced out of quality care, in terms of who is even accepted into medical schools, right? Um, who isn't? So all of those are structural issues. Um, but I think it, this, this conversation is making me think about how um, part of what we are called to do is also to think about strengthening programs around housing insecurity, housing security, sorry, um, free and culturally safe healthcare, um, you know, food security. These are a couple of, um, sort of sort of themes that came up in our presentation, but really thinking about how we shift the conditions that create harm and moving towards new formulations of health um, is what we're pushing for and what we're inviting conversation on because that's something that we can all um, think about together and brainstorm together. And it can look like lots of different things. And it could look like things that are outside of what we traditionally think of as medical, as, as the purview of medical institutions, right? Well, speaking of brainstorming outside the box of conventional medical knowledge, the next question from Alia 
what do you think are the most important points of intervention in creating and implementing anti-racist medical curriculum changes? Mm. Having just finished my, today was the last day of my uh, abolition medicine seminar, which is not uh, taught in a medical school, but there's plenty of pre-medical and actually practicing healthcare people in it. Um, it's a kind of a graduate, undergraduate combined class. Um, and I think what I'll do is I'll just speak from this specific course. Um, the most important thing, the most important notion that we came upon was Ruth Wilson Gilmore's idea that abolition is not about absence, it's about presence, right? It's about building life-affirming institutions, it's about um, building the world, imagining and then working toward the worlds we want to see. Um, so some of, to me, the most important part of that course has been um, the collective making of the knowledge. Um, so yes, I was the faculty member, I set up, you know, we learned about the Young Lords, we learned about the Black Panther Party, we learned about the invention of this pelvic speculum. But we also together then said, okay, what's the ground under all of our feet and where is our work um, located? So I think creating space within the kind of the traditional educational model um, for someone to come in and say, hey, you know what, I'm a child abuse pediatrician and I wanna think about the way that carceral logics work in the kind of child advocacy world and who gets caught, you know, who gets the police called and, and whose children get taken away and, and understand those through carceral logics and write to my fellow kind of child abuse pediatricians and talk about, um, you know, kind of taking away some of those logics and building up a new system. That's not something I had brought to the course. That's very specific to that person's experience. Pre-med students created an entirely new handbook for Columbia pre-med students on how to not just get your you know, physiology courses done, but also integrate um, abolitionist you know, ideas into their work. So everyone was kind of working, doing their work where they stood, right? Um, and so to me, Abolition, the exciting thing about the pedagogy of abolition um, medicine is that the pedagogy itself also must reflect the content, right? It's not enough to kind of say, oh, these are the five topics we must learn. The pedagogy itself must kind of approach learning from a Frarian or a bell hooks kind of point of view where the students themselves are bringing the knowledge and the change they wanna see made. Zara, do you have thoughts? Yeah, it's hard to follow that because <laughs> uh, I think that's the tone that I, that I think that's the tone that we really want to, you know, conclude on is getting people to think about how this is visionary work and this is stuff that we do together and stuff we brainstorm together. So, um, you know, what it means for um, us to think about uh, improvements in anti-racist medical curriculum is something that we, like we think about together, we can brainstorm together and oftentimes is sourced by the people in the room who are attracted to those spaces. Um, and um, uh, Aliyah, to your, to your other question about kind of how important it is to have people of color um, in medical training and practice being part of those movements. I mean, it's crucial, right? It's it's extremely, extremely crucial. One from like a representation perspective, but also because, um, you know, it's, in, it's important to have people who are um, driving the efforts that are directly impacting their own communities. Um, so I think that that's kind of another, um, another important aspect. One thing that I wanted to mention was that there are specific things within medical education and within um, kind of medicine itself that do require our attention and they could be immediate too, immediate things that can be changed. Like for example, within medical education, the way that we think about um, measuring kidney function through GFR, right? That's something that um, was based unethically on race and is formulated in a way that um, uh, specifically makes transplantation difficult for black patients, um, harder for, for black patients. And so one of the things that we talk about within abolition medicine spaces is challenging race-based diagnostic um, tools, right? That's something that we can immediately think about how it shows up in our own practices, how it shows up in our own hospitals and spaces and um, kind of resisting some of these more antiquated, um, scientifically inaccurate notions of, of biological race. Another thing that we can think about is how medicalized carceral spaces like nursing facilities, like psychiatric treatment facilities, how do they function? Um, some oftentimes under the pretense of care and rehabilitation but at the same time, 
many of them, um, you know, function to criminalize, to cage, cage and to disappear people across marginalized communities. Um, so these are things that exist, um, you know, within our healthcare system that we can directly challenge and we can directly resist and, and that can be considered abolition medicine work. I think we are at time. So I'm just gonna give out a call if, if there are like very important burning questions. I think we have a grace period of maybe two, three minutes. Yes, you can for sure get our emails. <laughs> yeah, I can pop mine in the Yeah, maybe if you put it in the chat. But I guess uh, while they do that, uh, Katie, Kim, and I would like to thank all the presenters, Anthony and Zara, for this amazing presentation, especially for being here live to answer all the questions. And our deepest thanks to all of you who took time out of your day um, to attend this lecture. It means a lot to us because this is such an important topic and we have been thinking about this for so long. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you for fun. having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for the shout out for uh, I'm glad your children enjoy my books. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. And thank you for having us. Bye bye. Thanks thank so. you all. And just a reminder that this is the first in a 10 part series. So we have another webinar coming up on May 19th with Perry class on disparities in infant and child mortality. And we hope folks will come back. Thank you so much, Sayantani Zara and in spirit, Yoshiko, for uh, kicking off this series. We're so grateful to you. Thanks, everyone.